Okay, so welcome to the next latest and greatest webinar uh, on CIS 211. Uh, we are in week eight, so we are in the final stretch, and I think technically uh, week eight ends, um, where is it? Uh, I want to say Tuesday the 24th. Let me look at the announcements here real quick. They always kind of have a weird end date. One week left, it looks to be, yeah, Tuesday, next Tuesday, 524 at 9 a.m., okay? So make sure that you have all your submissions in uh, by this time. The discussion is due, however, uh, what is it? Sunday, the 22nd by midnight. So make sure that you complete the discussion uh, on Sunday by midnight, but you got a couple of extra days uh, to turn in assignments uh, by Tuesday at 9 a.m., not p.m., Okay, so I have basically everything done by, by Monday night would be my strong suggestion. Okay, um, so with that said, yeah, same format as the other webinars. I want to kind of uh, talk about what it is that we need to do for um, week eight. And so let's, uh, let's just scroll down here to, uh, to week eight. All the important links still apply right? Important one being the virtual desktop. And um, I'll give you some guidance here in a little bit as far as how we can use the virtual desktop with the, what is it, final project. Uh, but we'll talk more about that shortly. So let's go down here to week eight, and we will see that we're going to continue our study of chapter 15, uh, which we also looked at here in week seven. So the good news is that um, no new reading material, um, assuming that you studied last week. But if not, yes, you definitely want to make sure that you're comfortable uh, with chapter 15. And if we look at chapter 15, it's all about uh, runtime analysis, um, worst case analysis, best case, average case. Um, but typically, most companies in industry are most concerned with worst case analysis, right? Or big O analysis, because at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, all of a sudden everybody logs in and sends data at the same time, or we have this huge data file, we need to know, well, well how do our algorithms run comparatively speaking, right? What's the best sorting algorithm for this particular data? What's the best searching algorithm for this particular data? And uh, there's all sorts of other algorithms beyond even searching and sorting. And we want to be able to compare apples to apples, right? Well, should I use this sorting algorithm or this sorting algorithm? They both do the same thing, but behind the scenes, they're quite a bit different. And that's why we do this runtime analysis or this um, big O analysis, OK? So um, yeah, be comfortable with chapter 15. Um, there are some supplemental material here. Uh, talk a little bit more about that in a second. But yeah, let's dive in and talk about the three things we need to do this week. First thing being the discussion. Uh, most of you have already uh, started this. And uh, they basically want us to talk about what's called a binary search. OK. Um, there's several different ways that we can search data. And if we, if we remember from last week, um, I believe it talked about a linear search in 15.2, was it? Uh, add elements. See here, sequential search. Some people call it sequential, some people call it linear search. But at the end of the day, uh, worst case scenario is that uh, we have an array full of data. We're looking for a particular value in that array, a key. And in order to find it, we go through the entire array, right? No big deal when you have 10 elements in the array, but as n goes to infinity, and let's say you have a million elements in the array or um, you know, n, n elements in the array, you have to look at all of them. So the, the runtime of a linear or sequential search is big O of n, worst case, is you have to look at all elements in the, the array. And so you have to go big O of N in order to find 
what it is that you're looking for, worst case analysis. Um, best case with sequential search is the element you're looking for is at the beginning of the array, right? The very first element of the array. And so best case runtime for sequential search would be big O of one. Average case, probably somewhere in between, right? Uh, probably somewhere towards the middle of the, of the um, array. And so in theory, average case should be um, maybe N over two, which uh, let's do big O cheat sheet. Maybe it lists what a linear search is here. Uh, oh, these are sorts, these are searches. Where's this? Oh, they do not list search times. They only list sorting. Oh, here, search. Search for an array. Uh, worst case is big O of N. However, average case of a search also tends to be uh, big O of one, uh, a big O of N, excuse me. So notice that worst case and average case doing a linear search into an array is, is, is pretty bad. Uh, there are much better data structures than a linear uh, that we can use to do a search. Things like stacks, uh, excuse me, where's the big O with log in here? Uh, binary trees and things like that, but I'm kind of getting off topic here. Um, what, what I'm trying to go at here is that every searching algorithm performs a little bit differently and we need to look at all three uh, run times. We need to look at best case. We need to look at average case. We need to look at worst case. And that is what your discussion is wanting you to do this week. Um, because last week we talked about uh, the runtime of a, of a random algorithm that had two loops. Um, and they wanted you to find the worst case runtime. And, and most people correctly recognized that it was big O of n squared, right? Because we had a loop inside of a loop and therefore it was big of n, n squared. Here, they're trying to get you to look at the best case runtime of a binary search, not a linear search, a binary search. And um, best, best case scenario for a binary search or any search for that matter is that uh, the element you look for, the element that you're looking for in that data structure is the very first element that you that your algorithm goes to, right? Uh, very low likelihood of happening, but definitely it is a possibility, okay? Uh, and that's what best case runtime analysis is, um, is that, well, if you had the, the perfect scenario and the data in your data structure is set up just right, what is, uh, what is the runtime in that situation? And yeah, usually a lot of best case runtimes for most algorithms are big O of, of one, okay? Um, so what does it want you to talk about? Uh, how are we able to determine the best case runtime is big O of one using a binary search? Well, if we look in the textbook, for a binary search, here's sequential. Uh, is it the next chapter or the chapter after that? I believe it's the chapter after that that talks about a binary search. Let me see here. Uh, here it is, 15.5 um, gives us uh, the algorithm for recursive binary search. And notice it is a divide and conquer. It is a recursive solution where the method called recursive binary search, right, is calling itself um, in one of these two uh, conditions. And you kind of have to look at this code and read and interpret its behavior to really understand what's going on. Uh, but at the end of the day, the way that the binary search works is instead of the linear search, you went to the very first element in the array, right? And then you just started traversing down the array and go, was well, that it? No, nope, is that it? And you go one by one 
uh, from the first element all the way to the last element. The recursive binary search is a little bit different for two reasons. Number one, in order to do a binary search, that data that is in the array has to be sorted. That is a requirement for a binary search. For a linear search, that data does not have to be sorted. Okay, two very important distinctions. But if we do have an array that is sorted for us already, we can run a binary search. And what it's going to do is it's going to go to the middle element of that array. And that is the very first number that it's going to look at and see if it has a match. Now, why does it go to the very middle number? Why not start at the first number like we did with a linear search? Well, because if we look at the middle number and if we find it, if we find what we're searching for, this key right here in the middle, well, then we return it. Boom, we're done. And that is best case scenario. That This is the big old one scenario, is if we go to the middle on the very first try and we find it, we return the base case. It stops calling itself recursively and therefore it is big O of one. That is best case scenario. Um, however, if it doesn't find itself, notice that it calls itself again, but the beauty of this is when it calls itself again, instead of going from start to end, we go from start to the middle. If the key is less than the middle, or we go from the middle to the end, if the key is greater than the middle. So what this is doing is it's, a, it's cutting the data set in half, right? With every call to recursive binary search, because the um, values are sorted already in the array, if we look at the middle and that's not our value, and we know that the key is less than what the middle is, well, we know that there's no reason to look to the right of that middle value because those are all greater than uh, what's currently in the middle. So we can discount half of the data set immediately because it is already sorted and we can make some inferences based on the sorting of that data. And the inferences will ignore all the data to the right of the middle if the key is less than. If you go, uh, if the key is greater than, we'll ignore all data to the left of the key because, uh, or the middle, because that is less than whatever we're looking for. So if we store this data in, in these data structures in a nice sorted way, in a nice sorted manner, we can perform some very efficient um, searches on that data, right? So that, that shows you automatically how, why searching and sorting are so important and why they go hand in hand. Because in order for us to perform a search um, in a, a, a good big O time, um, we need to sort the data first so that we can cut that data set in half with every search. If it's just random data and we never sorted it, well, then we just have to fall back on a linear or a sequential search and big O, uh, big o time for that is big O of n. But if we sort everything, we can do a recursive binary search in big O of log n time. If we look at the big O time, and it should state that somewhere down here, big O of log n, here we are. Big O of log n. If you do all the mathematics, it's log n. If you just look at cutting the data set in half and you, you, you graph how many data elements are left, anytime you cut a number in half every time, and you know that results in a log n uh, graph. So a couple different ways you could figure out log n. One is graphing the data set as this algorithm progresses and we'd see a nice log n graph. The other way is we do all this nice math here and we come up with log n being the dominant term of the final, um, of the final equation. Okay, but that's big O time. And what the discussion is asking for is not big O, but actually the best case, and I always forget which best case is this guy, um, is that omega, uh, the, the Greek symbol omega, I'm terrible with my Greek symbols, 
but this is big O, right? I think this is theta, okay? The, the O with the dash in it. And I believe, well, let's look at my Greek symbols. Uh, it looks like here. So theta is the O with the dash in the middle. So average case is theta. Instead of saying big O, you say you're doing theta analysis. And then um, that's average case. Best case is, where is it? Where is it? Omega. So when you're doing best case runtime analysis, you're doing omega analysis. And again, I don't know why uh, uh, they, they named them with Greek symbols, but they just did. So when we're doing best case runtime analysis here, we're doing omega analysis. So we would say that binary search is omega one, not big O of one. Okay, technically speaking, but a lot of uh, a lot of textbooks do this. They kind of mix and match when they're talking about best case, average case, worst case, and they just call everything big O. And technically, no. Um, technically, when we're doing best case, uh, we should be using well, even here. Oh, that's average case. Average worst. Best case is omega. This average case is theta. Worst case is big O. They're they're just it's just code names. For best case complexity, average case complexity, worst case complexity, okay? So for the discussion, you know, how are we able to determine it's big O of one? Well, best case scenario is the key that we're looking for, right, is right in the middle. As soon as you go to the middle, bada boom, bada bing, the key is there, it returns it and it's big O of one. And, and that's what we talked about a second ago. And a lot of you, uh, alluded to that in the discussion, which is great. Okay, so that's the discussion. Um, no real programming work involved. I suppose you could run the search algorithm and plot the size of the array. Uh, basically, like we did in what was it week seven, where we added a counter uh, inside of one of the sorting algorithms. You could do the same thing here, where we add a counter inside of the binary search and plot what n is uh, with a bunch of different recursive binary searches. And you would see that it is also log n time. They go of log n. All right, so enough about the discussion, but I wanted to make sure that high level, everyone understands what chapter 15 is all about and, and why all of a sudden we're talking about best case because it's not only about worst case. There are best case numbers, there are average case. And in fact, the average case analysis is kind of more important than either the best case or the worst case, right? Because average case is gonna happen the most amount of, of times in the real world, right? Not best case, not worst case. The answer always lies somewhere in the middle, but for some reason, not a lot of people are interested in average case analysis, but in industry, if you're in, in charge of a, of a major data processing algorithm, you should be very interested uh, in average case as well as worst case, okay? All right, so what's the other thing we need to do for week eight? Uh, comprehensive final exam. It is a, it does cover everything that we've covered here in CIS 211. Chapters nine to 15, you only have 45 minutes. So that's why make sure you are well prepared uh, for that. And you, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're familiar with all of this information and you should be as long as you've been progressing each week uh, throughout the course. 45 questions, five open response, two hours to take the exam, all right? Make sure that you're in a nice quiet place, you're well fed, you get a good night's sleep, right? All those little things definitely matter. matter. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, the CIS 211 project. So the project's kind of odd and the department came up with this. Um, they, so here's the deal that you need to write a, a program from scratch. And up to this point, we've been importing 
all of our code from the textbook activity frameworks. Um, however, here, they wanna know that you can write a program from scratch that does a, a counting sort or a sorting algorithm to take a random set of integers, right? Take a random set of integers here, sort them and then output them in order. And it looks like they want you to use a counting sort. Um, but if you look in the book, it's kind of odd. Even if you go into the index, um, there's nothing on counting sort. So here's the deal, at least for me, for this assignment, um, as long as you implement a sorting algorithm that can take this data and sort it and get to here, um, I'm happy. The book has, if we look up sorting algorithms or sort in the index, this is the old version of Google, by the way. This is what I used to have to do to find material. <laughs> All right, where's sort? LMN, here we go. They do describe in the book a bubble sort, an insertion sort, and a selection sort. Um, for me, feel free to use any of these. But the funny part is, if we go here, I believe these, yeah, they're in chapter eight. So a lot of these sorting algorithms, here's a, um, a lot of these sorting algorithms are in chapter eight. Let me take a look at, oh man, can I not get back to the search? Oh, boo. Um, look in chapter eight for the different, here, searching and sorting 8.6. This has some good information in it. Feel free to use any of that information. I do think that in chapter 15, there is another subsection on sorting here, 15.5. Okay. Um, where is it? Where is it? I thought, yeah, insertion sort is here. So there's another option for your sort. But yeah, if you've already done research on counting sort and you're comfortable with that, feel free to utilize the counting sort as well. But at the end of the day, um, as long as you meet these requirements and you can go from an array that looks like this to an array that looks like this and make sure that your output looks like this because this is what I'm, I'm going to be looking for. Okay. Then, um, then I'm happy. All right, so Joseph asked a good question here. Why is the big O complexity for counting sort? Well, let's, let's take a look at that here. Counting sort, big O is N plus K, okay? Notice that with all the other sorting algorithms, they are either big O of N squared or N log N, right? Uh, or N log N squared for this weird shell sort guy. But normally it's n squared or n log n. And then all of a sudden down here, we've got these k guys going on. And what these k variables are is k is a numerical value based on the largest number that you're trying to sort. So for instance, in this case, where did it go? In this case here, where we have all of these numbers here, it says K is equal to 90. Well, why is K equal to 90? Because 90 is the largest value in that list. And these, these, these particular sorting algorithms here that have K inside of the big O uh, runtime analysis is because these sorts can only sort numbers only. And they are based on using mathematical algorithms to figure out how to put each value into the proper bucket. Let's call it a bucket. Okay, bucket sort, radix sort, counting sort, they all are dependent upon 
using this K value, the max value that is inside of that list to help it determine how to set up its, its data structure behind the scenes to efficiently um, sort things. Okay, so yeah, these sorts are a little bit weird. Exactly right, Joseph. And that's why I'm saying they're a little bit weird because normally um, the other sorts make sense. Is it equal? No. Well, if not, then, then do this. But if you look at the counting sort, which again, the book doesn't really mention, I don't even think it calls out the bucket or the radix sort. Um, it's using math to determine um, how to do its sorting. And that's why this K value is there. And so if, if, you, if your largest number, here's where these algorithms might fall short, these sort, sorting algorithms. If you're sorting an array that has, let's say instead of, right, right here, our lowest value is 30, our highest value is 90, therefore K is 90. And N times 90 may not be that big a deal. However, imagine if, if the lowest number is one and the highest number is 1 billion, um, now all of a sudden K is 1 billion and it'll affect how much uh, it affects the runtime. It also affects the space complexity, how much memory that these, these algorithms need to, um, to take up. Because I think if you look at, right, look at the space complexity of these guys, big O of N, big O of N plus K. And if you look at the space complexity of the normal sorts, at least a few of them, heap sort, bubble sort, they're all big O of one. Okay, um, with the exception of, of these guys. So these sorts here are much more memory efficient uh, than these uh, values down here for these weird radix counting and bucket sorts. So again, that's, that's the whole reason we're doing big O analysis is because we wanna be able to compare apples to apples concerning time complexity and space complexity. And if we've got a memory constrained system, uh, yeah, don't don't pick one of these uh, bucket radix counting sorts. Pick one of these uh, one of these guys here that is big O of one. If we have all the memory in the world and we're looking for a very fast uh, sorting algorithm, we're probably going to pick uh, either one of these guys because it's terrible space complexity. But n log n is uh, the fastest, uh, really, that that you can get with uh, with sorting algorithms, right? But the space complexity is is terrible. So there's always trade offs, um, and that's the idea: is that you look at the results of all the these best case, average case, worst case. Uh, numbers and make an intelligent decision as far as which one of these sorts you're picking. And notice that it does depend on what your data set looks like, right? This K value is the largest value in your data set. And so if you could have some really big values in your data set, well, then you may not want to use uh, these sorts down here. Maybe you want to use some of these instead up here. Okay, so everything is that's the whole idea behind the, the, the runtime analysis and space complexity analysis is that we want to be able to compare apples to apples. All these data structures do the same thing, but they behave differently for access, search, insertion, and deletion. All these sorting algorithms do the same thing, but they behave differently under best case, average case, and worst case scenarios. And they also take up different amounts of memory. Okay. So, Back to the CIS211 project, as long as you sort these numbers and output them correctly after the sort using one of these sorting algorithms, either counting sort or you know one of those three that I, I pointed out a second ago in the book, I guess you could even find another. There's, there's a bunch of different sorts. Pick one as long as you, you implement it correctly 
I'm happy. Okay. Um, so that is your CIS 211 project. Um, I can't really give, oh, real quick. So how do we accomplish this? You're going to go into the remote desktop. Uh, we don't need any code, so we're not downloading um, any code. Uh, and this is a little bit different than the way we set up projects previously. That's why I want to go over this real quick here. Um, so here we are, we still want to create a new project like we always do. All right, let's give it a good name, Java, Java application. That's the same. Uh, let's give it a good name, 22 SPCMP. Oh, I don't know, CIS 211. Let's call it final project. All right, here's the difference. You do want to create a main class here. Um, they always go crazy with the package name. Um, I would just call it CIS 211, final project, but make sure this is checked, okay? Still leave this one unchecked. Leave this as the default project location, but this time you do wanna check create main class and go ahead and click on finish, okay? And what you'll see is that it creates uh, the Java file for you along with um, the main method. And this is where you wanna add your code that does the, the sorting, your final project requirements here inside of the main method. And then once you're done, run it, make sure your output looks good down here, and then you can submit. Okay, so for this week, you're gonna be creating a new project. You are gonna check that, you know, create file option so that you start out like this, and then you're gonna add all of your code here that will make sure that you can take an array that looks like this, and you can hard code this directly into your program, and then you call a sorting algorithm on it, and it should, when you print out that same array or list again, um, it should look like that when it's completed. Okay, so with that said, that's really all I have uh, for this week. I hope you have found these webinars useful. Please continue to email me and let me, you know, give me feedback. Um, I always appreciate that. Uh, if you have further questions, just reach out to me uh, via email and I'll see what kind of guidance I can give you. Okay, so have a great week and uh, let me know um, how I can help.